Hey guys, welcome back to Track Yards. I'm Captain Foley. I'm Connor Cockings, and I'm Gary O'Brien. That's right. We have a special guest with us today. Joining us, uh, fan film creator who does actually some really great, great fan films. Uh, you might know Chance Encounter or The Holy Core. If you haven't seen them, check them out. But we have him here to talk about ambition versus reality, making fan films. Green screen and doing it a certain way is one thing, but Gary's technique is a bit different. I think ambition is a good word. You know, all the people that do fan films, you can have you know a hundred green screen credit extras, or you can do a real practical set extension. And a very different sort of ambition and very different looks on screen. So hi Gary, how are you doing? And let's talk about what your ambition was for this second film. Your, hi, your... hi guys, first of all, and thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, ambition versus reality. Yeah, I think. You very kindly had me on before to talk about fundraising for this film, The Holy Court. And uh, in that video, I had some of my Kickstarter fundraising stuff where I had these little CG mock-ups of the two main sets that I was hoping to build. And uh, one was a ready room, uh, kind of, well, it's on a Nebula class ship, but it's, it's pretty much in the mold of Picard's ready room. And a kind of engineering type room called the deflector control room. And uh, I made these little CG mock-ups uh, as a kind of proof of concept to show potential donors what we were hoping to realize. And yeah. uh, fortunately, we managed to get a go ahead and make the film. And so then I was faced with the task of actually turning these 3D ideas into actual wooden sets that people could stand in and walk around in and we could film in. Um, so that was the ambition. And yeah, I think I, think I achieved it. Um, pretty happy with the way the sets look yes. we had the money to make the whole film but it was an ambitious film so it meant that every individual part of the film still didn't have a huge amount of money it's very easy to get carried away and start putting more and more detail and building it more than you need um and then realizing that you'd have run out of money so i didn't want that to happen so yeah uh balancing reality and ambition and yeah turning these sets into something real that we could film in yeah, and that's one of the things I really enjoyed watching these. Uh, I thought they were really well done, and the sets really impressed me. Like, usually when you see a fan film, you either know it's on, you know, one of the pre-built TOS sets or whatever, or it's somebody's, you know, garage, and you can tell. I just wanted to get, you know, say thank you for that, because it was something that kept me in the story. I wasn't taken out of it um, by something that didn't look like it fits. So That's really kind of you to say. Um, and obviously, you know what you're talking about with this sort of stuff as well, so it means a lot. So thank you. Um, but yeah, I'm glad as well you said it didn't take you out the story because, you know, as much as we like looking at these sets and obviously I've been pouring over the minutiae of it all, building them and stuff, really, of course, they are there just to support the story. So. Certainly, I'm sure you guys are the same whenever I'm watching Star Trek, whether it's a new episode I've not seen before or Discovery or whatever or something I've seen a million times. One part of my brain is constantly just looking at the sets because I'm just I just love looking at them. But on the other hand, it's like two parts of your brain working at the same time so that you, uh, you're enjoying the story and watching all that and liking it. But part of you's going, wow, look at, look at the, that L cars panel or whatever. It's just like a weird thing your brain can do. So I'm glad that um, the sets didn't pull, pull, pull you out of the story at any point. A lot of people said, well, why don't you build the bridge or something? And like the ready room isn't necessarily the obvious choice to make is kind of the, the main set. Um, but because so much of the story happens there, it seemed like, well, that was the one that was worth putting the, the real energy into. Um, even though in a weird way, it's kind of like not that, it's kind of like a, it's an office, you know, it's not the most interesting, sexy sci-fi thing to make like a room with a, you know, like a, a, an oven and a desk in it, basically. Um, but that's what I wanted to do. So I'm glad that you liked it, man. You know, a lot of these fan films, as I've been involved in so many, the scope is through the green screen because you can do unlimited digital sets, you can do unlimited scale actually saying to those people who might be filmmakers at core but not be able to build anything impractical but they can on the computer so as uh, you've done a little bit of both obviously doing mock-ups and such what do you think now in retrospect it was more ambitious to think let's do a practical room which is a uh, takes days weeks to build at a certain level or would it, been, or would it have been more ambitious to do full digital sets and do the green screen option hmm interesting question actually because i think because there's a standard to the green screen, as there is with r real sets. So, because you could just chuck up a green screen and just slap a JPEG behind you and say, well, I've, I've done it, you know. Um, but then, but of course, you can do, you can put tracking markers in and do handheld cameras. And then how, how, how much effort do you put making your practical lights match your supposed CG environment? Obviously, you know, that sort of traditional sort of early 2000s Star Trek fan film 
is green screen but you compare that to like a modern day hollywood movie that's doing these same effects they're worlds apart but essentially they're still where you've used the green screen so there'd be a limiting principle of like well how far do you want to try and push this to look realistic and and would you start simplifying your shots down because each one of these setups to do in a green screen it's as you know it's like it's it's a real mind bender to make sure that you're shooting these things at the right angle i mean you know well there's a million aspects to it but certainly one of the things is like the right angle now in one of for, as an example on that in in the holy core there's a reverse shot on the bridge um and it's actually me as like one of my little cameos i've got my i'm standing at the tactical station with my back to the camera and i just walk out of frame and it's yeah, i'm just there to fill out the bridge and have make it not just look but empty i must have done 50 takes on that just to make sure that the angle of my body was lining up with this with the you know with the the way I would be standing if I was really at that console which of course wasn't there and I would shoot a few off and then I'd come back I'd copy them onto the machine I'd dump them into After Effects do a rough key and go nah I, that's sort of all right but I'm still my torso's just sort of I'm sort of not quite looking into the room I'm sort of looking to the side and think ah oh, I'll go and do one more then so, you know for me I think trying to do it that way ironically would have been more ambitious because I'm just a real stickler for for that kind of stuff and trying to just conceive of it all and real time check what you're doing i mean i was happy to do that at my house because i was just going back and forth between rooms but if i was with a bunch of actors on a sound stage then you need to be monitoring that in real time and directing their body and the actors hate it because they're like oh, i'm just trying to do the performance but that was great but you were three degrees to the right and you should have been so, so yeah for me the green screen stuff would probably be more ambitious ironically yeah when you're visualizing a scene, whether you're writing it or directing it at the moment, are you thinking, what can I, what can I do visually, or, or does it limit the amount of rooms you could have the the thing in? Like, are you thinking that as you're writing it? Like, I have a certain amount of sets, I don't want to have to build another set for this scene, so I'm going to have to change this scene. Is that something that goes through your thought process? Certainly, Even when I was writing this film with my friend Paul, it's like we've got two thoughts in mind you know the thing of like reality versus what you want to write and what we tried to do was was not limit ourselves too much at the very start when we we're coming up with the story and broadly writing it so we try not to worry too much but at the same time it's kind of stupid writing a load of stuff where you go to 50 different planets because then they beam down then they go to the trunk you know then they go three corridor sequences they're all tracking shots for 20 minutes it's like oh. yeah exactly so it's like it's always in the back of your mind but you try not to let it stifle the creativity early on and then as time goes on you start going well hang on a minute we could just simplify this and shoot it in the same room and in fact there's a great example of that actually in the holy core which my original concept of of that film was that uh, there's a very brief scene at the start of the film where the engineer and the first officer they have a quiet little moment it's only like 30 seconds but it just establishes that those two are a kind of couple and that they're looking forward to having their um, anniversary dinner and originally that uh, was going to take place in uh, a corridor i wanted to do one of these scenes we always see where they're just walking down their little bit of corridor and the plan was to do a set extension i was going to build one physical wall and which was then going to be reused in the deflector control room as the deflector control room wall but the rest of the corridor was going to be green screen and we were going to do all that. One reason or another, I think budgetary actually was the main reason, um, we decided, you know what, that's a whole new set, a whole complication, all this green screen work. Why don't we just find a way to just change a few lines here in the script and now bam, they, everybody else can just leave the room and they'll just have their little moment in the room. And it was like 50 times easier and probably like better for the viewer as well in some ways because it all just sort of flowed out of one scene. Well, it's funny to call you out on that because one of the things I actually had not a problem with but noticed is like if the captain leaves her own ready room and the commander's like, oh, can I, just, can I just, you know, talk to you alone, not captain in your private ready room? It's like, hmm, don't think that'd be with procedure to allow to do that. It's like, this is not an appropriate conversation for your ready room after they leave. Which should have been in a turbo lift would have been a more natural like. Because I did have this exact thought process. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, a few months ago when we were making the film, and I'm, I was certain that there it are one or two instances where people have gone in, certainly in Picard's ready room, without him, even though he's on board That's the ship. Because so you're right, it's very unusual. But I, I'm certain there was at least one, maybe where Riker's called somebody in to have a quick chat with him. But speaking of, you know, good enough, but really you could add something, you know, again, the reality versus not, 
having to physically build something uh, in in reality versus 3D. In 3D, the detail level only goes up to the time you want to spend. And and you know, a, a true professional who's been working in the industry for ten years can model and take something in in days when a novice could do it in in years. That's obviously a distinction as well. And getting photo real, whereas building it, again, time and detail. But at the same token, you're limited by how much how much space do I have in my my studio? Is it my house? Is it you know? Are we only seeing what we see? And so. Well, that's all we have. You know, we have these relatively, bl relatively blank walls. So if you had done the green screen, you could have had bigger sets. That room, I think, works an absolute treat. But then you look at the um, deflector control, and you think it's quite a small room. If it, well, if you had green screen, it would have been you could have more elaborate, more depth, whatever. But then the the, the nice caveat, the way you did it, is that you do have specifically a shot where they go out into the corridor, and now suddenly you get the scale of the ship by doing a green screen shot, so you kind of win the both worlds there. And in fact, me and Stuart just re and watched episode of TNG this week for one of our lives, again, when this was filmed uh, a while ago, um, and they see uh, Geordi and Worf in this very tiny control, a sensor control, and it's a tiddly set that's clearly just a redress of a corridor that's added a flat and it's repainted and it's you know never seen again. And it's like, there are really ditzy little rooms. Yeah, no, that was it. I mean, it's the same as reason like why on TNG we only ever saw the tiny shuttle there and not the main one. Um, or that, that same little tract of corridor rather than all those expansive ones that we know were there. Yeah, I think, and also I think people are quite forgiving on a fan film when they can, it's like, well, surely that deflector control room might be a bit bigger than that. It's kind of like, yeah, but at the same time people are like, but you've clearly put some effort into building something. And I think it's, yeah, I think people kind of appreciate it in that sense. It's a fan film, but if you can get the, the audience member saying, oh, that's quite a small developer control room, versus, that's a shitty set. Like, if they're saying the, what, the third thing the first, you've already won. Yeah, you're just thinking, right. Mm, they're not that high-end officers, rather than this looks like a bad set. You've already won the battle, you know. It, it's like, you know, the they're not talking about the costumes, or the props, or the hair, or the acting. If that's the thing, it's like, well, that's a great success, you know. Uh, and speaking of hack, actually physical props that you have, I got a, a picture in front of me here of you sitting in the captain's chair, um, writing in your binder. So do you have a TNG captain's chair that you just have hanging out in your house? Is that a thing? No, I wish I did. That would be great. Um, no, it was uh, a guy who reached out to me, James Dillon, and he's got a Facebook group that people should check out. It's called uh, USS Riker's Beard. I believe you know him, Sam. I think you did some done. stuff for him, didn't you? I have done some work with him, yeah. Nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's a really sweet guy. He's really cool. And uh, he just reached out to me, I think, when during the fundraising. And he, he was like, look, I've got all these pieces. Like his, One of the things he does is he, he goes around little, the smaller conventions and puts this, these things out, which he's just built at his own expense. And he just gets people to take their photos on them and they give the money to various charities. Mm -hmm. and yeah, stuff. he said, look, I've got these command chairs. And I was like, cool, I'll, I'll have those then. Nice one. And I just built the gray box thing that sits directly behind the captain's chair. And, uh, and oh. it meant we didn't have to green screen the captain anywhere near as much because she always had something real behind her. And she just had nice sharp edges that were easy to green screen. So. And we are going to talk about the, the digital extension and how do you incorporate elements. But then, uh, you know, having a certain expectation and then the reality, being able to have these 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 chairs, these pieces, I mean, were you tempted then to, you know, once you knew you had them, your expectation obviously changed. Is the reality of how they're used kind of the minimum you wanted to? Do you wish you'd done them more? Do you wish you'd now planned extra bridge shot? Because, I mean, I'm looking at still with the captains of the side angle, you see all three, and it's basically flawless. It's, it's yeah, um, no, interesting question. I think I probably didn't, because my overriding thought the whole time was as soon as you're doing green screen, unless you've got some ridiculously high budget and, and like a full crew lighting it perfectly and all the practical lighting that will match and all this stuff, then you're the more of it you do, the more likely you are to screw it up at some point and ruin all the other good shots that you did get right. And so my view was, danger, Will Robinson, of the green screen. Do as little of it as you as you need to. Um, and also the film, it's quite tightly paced, and there really isn't the, the, there was no need to linger on the bridge scenes. There's you know the bridge scenes they come and they go and they they serve their purpose and that's it. We didn't need to like just chill out on the bridge for extended periods so i seem to recall that in the indiegogo pitch there was a lot of uh, expectations for space shots um when i actually saw the show um there was a lot of very great visuals of the nebula class and things like that um so what was that process like did you incorporate more than you originally planned because you got some good effects or what was the situation there Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, I'm really pleased with the way the um, space shots came out. 
Um, I think they're yeah they they look great. I'm really pleased with them. And they um, feel like and... TNG, which is always you know having the feel right is just almost more important than how they look. You know you can you can you can badly do a polygon, but if they just feel wrong you're, you're right Stu in the sort of promo stuff I was doing um, the space shots myself um, I found I honestly can't remember I'd happily say if I could remember but I just found the mesh on one of these like the first few sites that come up if you google Star Trek meshes um, and I'd used that and I'd slightly modified the one I found not much I added like a few little details on it I think I put some like thruster quads and stuff like that on it but I didn't do a great deal um, and uh and they were of a standard. They were like they were good enough for the promo material. Um, and then a friend of mine, Dave, he he's better at that kind of stuff than me. And he he was aware, and he kind of stepped forward straight away and said, "Can I do it?" Or maybe I approached him. I can't even remember now. But he was all on board to like he was really keen, and I was very keen to have him do it. Um, but then uh, Alex, who's the executive producer on the film, um, he suggested somebody he'd worked with before, Jim. And uh, he said, like, I think we should use Jim. He, he's great. He'll do good work. And I said, OK, yeah, you're, you're the executive producer. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Um, and so, yeah, I was very much sort of hands. Well, I was hands off the space shots in terms of mechanically doing them. Um, I would just sort of direct Jim into how I wanted the just shots to look. And he would send me, you know, these pre ones. And I might just have some comments about the speed of them or whatever or um, but yeah, generally I left all that to him and I was thrilled that I did because it was one huge part of the film that I didn't have to be involved in because it is, as you obviously, Sam, know, it's like a lot of work to get those shots to work. Um, and but also in terms of, you mentioned the sort of the style of TNG, that was one of the things that I'd said to Jim as well early on was like, we can do amazing, cool flyby shots and all these more kind of JJ-esque era Dutch pans and sort of rivet scraping flybys and stuff but i said i know we can do all that but let's not even bother going down that route because i want this to feel reminiscent of tng and so we didn't i don't think we sort of whole cloth copied tng stock shots because uh, partly because a lot of our shots are actually telling a story um so they had to do something specific which there's no tng stock shots to match uh but but broadly, I just said, yeah, let's keep it pared down because that's what TNG was. I, in fact, I think I even said to him in an email, let's let's not try and do anything that couldn't be done with a motion control rig. Let's imagine we've got a stand and we can't do anything too fancy. Which is funny because then you're sort of, and this is, obviously I do VFX for lots of different fan productions and my own. And so I'm used to working the director and just me inventing them and being the top boss on that. But you gave an expectation almost to keep it at the level that was achievable, even though now with VFX you can do anything if, if the if the artist is good enough. And so expectations could just be the most fanciful, epic, zoomy shots, but you're suddenly saying, well, no, actually, let's, I expect it to feel like TNG, and the reality was more motion control -y things, which is what you know, Doug Drexler did for Continues, they limited it, but then you get the exact vibe. And again, that, that speaks to the authenticity. You know, when I watched uh, this this film, you, you get suckered in so quickly, and in a good way, you know, to, to just in the vibe you know it, it creates that and it keeps reinforcing it every step of the way and i think the vfx did a good job so hopefully you know the having not on your plate anymore you think the, the reality of being better than the expectations and i must admit that's also had we done like like the far more modern you know over the top maybe visuals it just wouldn't have matched the interiors as well with our little you know little sets because that's where you get kind of i mean i i actually do quite like the TOS remasters I think I'm glad they remastered them but you do get this slight disconnect between the you know the footage and the new CG stuff they just don't quite match and so um I didn't want that you know I didn't that's something where at least discovery they'll they'll be doing the same freaking barrel rolls on their cameras that they're doing with their visual effects so at least they match up you know there's no discrepancy between the interiors and the exteriors but. so I guess you know the journey is at an end it's been released now for quite a while d d you know, uh, you visualized it all when you finally sort of saw the final thing. You what? Know, so you saw the steps as it went on, but when you can finally sit down and watch it. How does it compare to your original writing vision and thematic vision, and how was that final? Uh, yeah, I think I'm quite pleased that it, it. I think the finished product actually is is pretty much in line with what I hoped we could achieve. I mean, I was lucky that I'd done one of these already, and we'd built the the little shuttle set um, for that, and so I kind of was like okay i think that's the smallest set you can build realistically 
but I thought it, I did a sort of good job on it. And I was like, well, that's, that's, that is doable. Right, that can be done. So I was like, well, the next step then is to do something that people can stand up in. You know, wow, the next step. Uh, let's have a natural room. Uh, and so, yeah, I was like, look, these, th this can be done. And so, as we were saying earlier as well, when we're writing it, you try not to write something that you just that's stupid to write because you can't achieve it. And so, yeah, broadly, I think in terms of the production value, I think it's kind of where I hoped it would be. And in terms of like fulfilling the story ideas, I think so, broadly. Yeah, I mean, I think you always look back and go, oh, you know, you have your slight lingering doubts about this part or that part and whether you told the story or not. But yeah, for the most part, I think it pretty much turned out how I kind of hoped it would. So, so yeah, I'm pretty pleased overall, I think. That's awesome. All right, well, I think that's it for this episode. Um, if you guys have any comments or questions for him, put them down in the comments below because I'm sure he will be checking those out and uh, responding. Um, but I'd like to thank you, Gary, for coming on and ch chatting with us. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm sure we'll be talking to you again about a few other topics as well. So thank and not, you. And not straight after this with another idea we've already had. That, that, no, of course not. <laughs> nice one. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. And go watch the film right now. Yes. 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 Go watch Chance Encounter and the Holy Core. Check them out. They're really, they're really well done, and I really enjoyed them. So, until next time, everyone. I'm Captain Foley. I'm Connor Huggins, and I'm Gary O'Brien. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.